Welcome to Rogue Trader. Please read the disclaimer and remember that prices can go down as well as up. So at last I get to Techmar Group PLC. Techmar Group are part of my Greta Gold series. Techmar Group is definitely a renewables play. They make cable protection systems for the undersea cables that are used on the wind farms. Now the problem with all the renewable stocks I've been looking at is the share prices have been going crazy high in the last year. And so there's a bit of a worry here that we've missed the Greta Gold Rush. But actually in the case of Tecmar, the share price has been going down a lot and it's now a third of what it was about a year ago. So this actually makes Tecmar Group look like a good opportunity to invest in renewable wind energy but actually at a decent price. The price to book ratio for Tecmar is only 0.7 at the moment. So here we can see the TechLink cable protection system. And this is in fact their main product. It accounts for 43% of their sales. They listed on AIM in 2018. You can see they've got quite a good sales presence at least all over the globe. For this very specialist niche of cable protection systems, they actually have 75% global market share. 20% of their revenue actually does come from oil and gas. They have this subsea sector, which also supplies interconnectors, telecoms and marine civil engineering things. But their offshore wind is now 63% of the overall business revenue. They have the TechLink products. They also do front end evaluation and design studies sales and construction of the cable protection systems and then maintenance and i noticed that maintenance is six percent of revenue so that in the future when they get more customers could become a nice little revenue stream on its own right they've separated their company into these different divisions and we see most of it is techmar energy built around their TechLink products and in the last year they've gained projects in france china taiwan and also the Hornsey 2 project. The Hornsey 2 project is actually the largest wind farm in the world. So it's good that they've got that one. So Agile Tech Engineering is a subsidiary that they bought in 2019. And this does geological surveys, which does complement the business a bit. They also acquired Pipe Shield International in 2019. They make concrete mattresses. And then of course they have their subsea innovations division. So you can see in this image from their annual reports, um, this is the TechLink product, which connects to the wind turbines. And you see they have all these other ancillary products as well. And here we have these concrete mattresses, which are what the Pipe Shield International purchase were all about. So to talk about the bull case for Tecmar, here's all the renewable energy in the UK and you can see it's mostly wind. And actually the biggest baddie now in terms of carbon emissions is natural gas. This is for electricity generation. So it makes sense to further develop the wind power in order to replace some of this natural gas. So Boris Johnson has vouched to spend a trillion on green energy by 2050. And the EU have announced the Green New Deal, which should, which should mean another trillion going into this field by 2050. And of course, Joe Biden has pledged 1.7 trillion to go into green energy by 2050. So there's a lot of money piling into this sector. Now, this slide comes from the latest Tecmar investor presentation. And you can see how the, you can see here how there's actually about 30 gigawatts of global of wind power globally commissioned and actually there's the same amount roughly being constructed right now as there is already in existence so you can quite clearly see the bubble here in um, the development of wind farms and there's even 172 gigawatts planned to be constructed by 2030 so there clearly is a lot of growth in this area and Tecmar are quite clear how they're focusing on this as a uh, way of uh, generating money and um, increasing their revenues. So for us, the Tecmar story really began in June 2019 
when they listed as an AIM stock. Now, it actually used to be a family company and their CEO was the owner's son. And we can see here a video which gives us a bit of an, a little bit of an impression of the razzmatazz around that IPO. What is Tecma? Tecma Group is a market leading provider of subsea cable protection systems that plug into all these offshore wind farms that are being installed around the world. How have you got yourself involved in that? So my father founded this company nearly 30 years ago. Uh, it was a small lifestyle business and then I looked to buy it off him in 2011, brought on private equity. We grew and matured the business and then took it through into an IPO, becoming a PLC in uh, June this year. Pretty much straight from school, so this is all you've ever known? Yeah, this is my, this is my life, my legacy and hopefully going to be my future as well. They IPO'd in 2019 and by the way, the James Ritchie guy you saw there, he actually got a million quid as part of the deal when they IPO'd. So for the next year, the revenues and stuff were actually quite good, as I'll come on to later. And the only news was really that they, they bought a couple of businesses. They bought this agile tech engineering business and they bought this Pipe Shield International. Now, the, here's the RNS for the Pipe Shield deal. And really, uh, what they do is they make concrete mattress protection systems for the cables. And um, they are kind of complementary to their business. But I like to check out, was it a good deal or not? And they paid six and a half million for that company. And that company had a revenue of about seven million, a profit of about a million, and net assets of 3.1 million. Subsequently, they seem to be achieving similar revenues, although it dipped down by half in 2020, but they seem to be back up to six mil a year now. So overall, I'd say it wasn't a really good deal, but it wasn't a really bad deal either. Now, you see, we had the Corona crash, which is kind of a, a logical explanation for the stock price to go down. And then actually, they, the, the, the really the share price has been decimated ever since around mid 2020. And one of the main things was um, that James Ritchie guy that you just saw, having inherited the business, IPO'd, got his million quid, then left the business like a bat out of hell. And um, I don't know the circumstances there, but... Um, then their, their chairman then now has took over as CEO. And we'd had a trading update in early 2020, everything okay, shortly before James Ritchie left. And then shortly after the new CEO came in, he then announced a business review and a trading update where he announced where actually things were starting to go a bit wrong. So here's the trading update and the main things were that the the half year 21 sales were down 10 percent they were blaming this on covid and they had this very strange message very strange little bit here where they say that there's increasing competition for their core market for tech link now just this little line here is a bit of an alarming little statement and it's kind of the only mention you get of the, of this, um, you know, subsequently. I, I've not seen this. Men That's quite a nasty signal there. So, yeah, so they said, um, yeah, sales down 10%. And they actually also, they were changing the year end, shifting it from March till September. And then in their 2021 interims, they actually weren't very good. They were kind of in line with the profit warning before, but they still weren't very good. And there is, again, a strange thing where they said they did not want to affirm guidance for the next year. So obviously, we were really interested in these as a renewable play that seemed to be coming at a cheap price. We, we know the price to books only 0.7. But then there's a string of little bits of bad news here. And then if all that wasn't enough, only very recently, they've announced that there's been a problem on a wind farm using their system. So here's the news release, and it was essentially Orsted had announced on their quarterly update that they'd had problems on 10 of their wind farms. And in this RNS, Techmar say they're talking to them about one of those 10 wind farms. 
where there's been abrasion of the cable protection system against the rock scour installed on the seabed. So what seems to have happened is you have like scour, which is where where the uh, leg is of the wind turbine, you get the sediment sinking into the ground. So they put like rocks over that to protect it. And then you've got your tech link here. And what Orsted said was that the um, this tech link product had been rubbing against the rocks uh, for the scour protection, uh, which has then damaged and actually called a f caused a failure on one of their wind farms. Based on this report, though, I think it's not necessarily that all 10 of them had the TechLink product. It might be that only, you know, the one that TechLink are talking to them about um, was the one that had their system on. So not quite sure there. Um, but there seems to be risk here of a major meltdown for this company, really, you know, worst case. But then on the positive side, they do say that they do not anticipate a material financial impact for Techmar Group. So, you know, so lots of negative news flow there. And so really, I wanted to investigate that by taking a look a bit more in a bit more detail about what was going on there. So I looked at the Orsted quarterly update and they do say that um, they do, they kind of back up what Tecmar have said here. They actually mentioned that there was a, um, an impact of 3 billion. That's actually Danish Krona, but I think that's quite a few hundred million pounds. So what I did is I took a look at the Orsted quarterly updates and the and the internet call they had with their investors and here's a couple of clips where they discuss this problem at the race bank wind farm in the first clip their cfo explains the problem and then the second clip is where some of the analysts started asking some difficult questions to try and find out are you going to be suing anyone around this during a cable inspection campaign uh, at a race bank offshore wind farm, uh, we discovered uh, an array cable failure that was caused by an issue with the cable protection system. The issue uh, occurs when the cable protection system moves across the scour protection, uh, which are the rocks uh, placed uh, that prevent seabed erosion around the foundations. This can abrade the cable protection system and in worst case cause the cables to fail. As the cable protection system design was the common uh, solution for several years, we currently uh, assess that the issue could impact uh, up to 10 of our offshore wind farms across UK uh, and continental Europe. It should be noted uh, that some of those wind farms, the risk uh, could be related to only a handful of cable protection systems. So even though we mention up to 10 wind farms being at risk, the extent of the risk varies across the wind farms and further engineering work uh, is being undertaken uh, to define uh, the, our understanding. Uh, the cable protection system design uh, has been uh, updated, uh, so we won't expect uh, to uh, see impact uh, the projects uh, on the, what we are currently constructing uh, or developing. We are taking proactive measures uh, to ensure the long-term integrity of our assets by engaging uh, in a two-phased approach. Phase one uh, will seek to stabilize the cable protection system to prevent uh, further degradation uh, and will be undertaken uh, in 2021. While phase two uh, will be repairing or replacing damaged cables and is likely to be undertaken uh, in 2022 uh, to 2023. The, the stabilization uh, will deliver the optimal uh, value risk management in the short term to prevent uh, further damage uh, and can likely eliminate uh, the need to repair or replace most of the less damaged cables in phase two. Further, uh, we expect limited production uh, downtime from the stabilization activities. Our early assessment uh, is a total financial impact of around uh, 3 billion, 
uh, across uh, 2021 to 2023, uh, with the largest part uh, of the cash outflows in 2022 and 2023. And we have made uh, a warranty provision uh, of 0 0.8 billion to cover potential uh, costs towards our partners. We expect that the largest uh, cash out outflows uh, will be in 2022 and 2023 as part of the phase two campaign. Of the three billion, uh, we expect uh, that approximately one third can be capitalized and two thirds will impact ABDA. We will continue to make further investigations concerning the cable protection system issue, uh, as well as the uh, redemption measures needed, uh, including the impact in relation to suppliers, partners and insurance. We expect to have better understanding uh, of the issue and the impact towards the end of the year. If we then turn to the financial performance... Uh Our next question comes from the line of Peter Bischtiger of Bank of America. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you. So um, back to these cables, please. And um, Marianne, I think you touched on this earlier, but if, if you could provide a little bit more detail. Um, so can you just clarify, is this cable issue specific to the way that these 10 wind farms have been designed? Uh, or is it an issue with the equipment? And I guess the sort of pertinent uh, sort of points related to that would be, um, you know, can you claim under insurance here uh, or could you get damages from your equipment supplier? Um, and also, is, is this an issue that, that could potentially affect other offshore wind farms owned by other companies? So is this a sort of generic offshore wind farm problem? Yeah, uh, j just to go a, a little bit back in history, because I think that's quite useful. Uh, for the first many wind farms we built, uh, we had another solution. Uh, we had a so-called double layer of rock. So first we had a rock uh, around uh, the monopile, uh, then we had the cable coming out, uh, and then we put rocks uh, on, on top again. Uh, then uh, we found out that, uh, together with the industry, uh, that we thought there was a better solution uh, and therefore we did not put the additional second rock layer on top. Uh, that was believed to be uh, the best solution and, and, and we then used that for, for 10 of our, our wind farms. Uh, we then now have found out that that's not uh, a, a good solution. Uh, so uh, for, the, for the ones we are uh, constructing right now, uh, Horn C2 and, uh, and Shanghua, we are stabilizing the, the cables again. So therefore, in a way, it is these 10 specific uh, wind farms uh, where the competitors uh, ha have the same issue. In a way, it, it's not for us, uh, us to guess, but, but uh, this solution was, in a way, the industry norm <laughs> in, in, in this uh, period. Uh, Uh, and okay, and so then there's no, this isn't an issue with uh, the cable protection in its so you can't really go back to suppliers and, and uh, claim uh, that, that, that the system's faulty. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Uh, we are, in a way, out with this bad news very early. Uh, so it's not so that we have done uh, all uh, the, the investigation work. And, and, and we are working with could there be potential uh, claims uh, towards insurance, uh, suppliers, et, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not so that we expect that to, uh, to change this three billion number uh, significantly. But, but of course, we are, are in, a, in a phase now where we are seeking uh, out all kind of, <laughs> of, of, of things that could, could help uh, reduce the cost for us. Sure. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. From listening to the Osted call, it's still not entirely clear if Tecma are going to be on the hook or for that or not. Um, it seemed to be touted as not a problem with the actual uh, protection system, but more a problem with the installation with these rocks being on top. So in terms of this race bank farm, I then decided to have a bit of a dig into that and see, well, how involved were Tecmar in the actual installation? And I, I found back in 2016, this news article where it, they're really trumpeting that Tecmar's cable protection system is gonna be used for the race bank 
onshore offshore wind farm and it's here in this it's very clear yes Techmar a, a, a Techmar are providing the the cable protection system for the race bank offshore wind farm then however in this news article renewable energy news there's a link to the company uh, deep ocean it says that for the race bank offshore wind farm it's actually going to be deep ocean who are laying the cables and installing the cables but here it clearly says that deep ocean have got the contract to install and trench the cables to the wind farm and I went on to the Deep Ocean website and found this RNS from 2017 where they're bragging about winning the contract to actually lay and install the cables on the race bank wind farm site. It quite clearly says here in the Deep Ocean RNS, the scope also included route engineering, pre-lay graffle runs and cable protection system installation. And then what's also very interesting is that Deep Ocean, I later found, actually only in January this year, actually wound down that part of their business, their cable laying and trenching business. That's now defunct and completely wound down as a uh, business, which is interesting that um, they found it to be loss making and stuff um, after the problems we now know about that were kind of hidden away. So after all that investigation, I tend to lead towards believing Techmar Group's RNS that actually they do not expect any financial liabilities from this apparently really nasty news release. So on to the profit and loss. And we see that the revenue has increased quite impressively up to uh, 2020 full year however unfortunately the expenditure also increased and you can see here how the expenditure has hugged the income and so that the uh, the net income ended up at around 2 million per year still an improvement on before but quite a kind of a thin margin and then in the 2021 interims they announced, of course, that the revenues were down 10%, whilst when I looked into it, the cost of sales and operating expenses were about the same. So we have a situation where, although they were actually uh, starting to make money after the IPO, ever since we had the interims at the end of 2020, we now look like they're in a situation where they're losing money. They announced as well in their most recent investor call that they would sacked 6% of the staff and the, they'd reduced the factory footprint by 25%. However, that's kind of light touch, but maybe that will save a million or two to help redeem the situation. So the, the company has the uh, Techmar Energy, Pipe Shield International, Subsea Innovations and Agile Tech Engineering sectors. And we see that the revenues for those um, are mainly dominated by Techmar Energy, which seems fairly choppy. Then when we look at the profit by division, we see that actually their subsea oil and gas stuff and all this is kind of saving the day in a way. And there's a, there's a continual downtrend in the Techmar Energy part of the pie, which is the majority of their revenues. So, we have to be a bit cautious here of is this trend going to continue now in line of the predictions of their ever more investment in renewable energy their sales pipeline or their tender pipeline is going up but the analysts have actually kept the future estimates fairly even stevens when i look at the assets and debt the first thing that strikes me is how the company was transformed by the IPO and actually I'm quite impressed with the IPO and uh, what James Ritchie did when I look at these numbers they were actually negative net assets and you see that they had 32 to 33 million in long-term debt 
before the IP before the IPO happened. And then following the IPO, that IPO has cleared all of their debt. So then what happened was these uh, finance costs, which are presumably paying off interest on those loans, those were put to an end by the IPO by clearing that debt. And then that's how they achieved profitability following the IPO. And so you can see that looks, and so that then looks nice. Their asset and debt profile looks much better following the IPO. The most interesting thing is this trade in other receivables. And their CFO gave an explanation of that in the latest analyst update. So how it works is uh, these trade and other receivables, they're mostly contract assets, accrued income. And so how this company works is they have a number of projects ongoing with the different wind farms and things. And those all have tasks that have to be completed and then they accrue income as the uh, different goods are delivered and the different um, different miles, the different steps of the project are completed. But then this doesn't get paid until they meet the actual milestones. So this explains how they have this constant churn of money as accrued income. And it gives a nice indicator of the general health of, the, of how much work's going on. Uh, because obviously the more work going on, the higher the amount of churn there is. So part of their explanation of why they were moving their year end to September from March was that this would actually give a better representation of where they were with all these uh, contracts because of uh, the timelines when the accrued income gets paid in. And they did make some, and their CFO did say that there were a number of contracts where the cash would have come in in these interims, but they were they were delayed because the customers had added things they wanted doing on the projects, which actually meant more money for Techmar Group, but it means they get their money later. So this kind of presents a, a possibility that they could actually have better results when we get to the full year than the unple unpleasant kind of indicators of the interim, but still that's only speculation and, you know, it could there could be worse reasons why they have uh, delayed their full year. And one important thing um, to notice is the short-term debt jumped to 3 million as of the interims for 2021. And this was actually, they, this was where they took on a COVID loan. Obviously the government were giving away COVID loans to anyone who wanted one. And they took advantage of this. But it does mean of their 4 million of cash, Three million of that was new debt. And that does kind of concern me a bit that with the lower revenues, are they kind of running out of cash a bit? Are they running on gas now? So the statement of cash flows obviously follows on very nicely from that. And this is 2020 numbers. And we see that in the, two we see that in the 2020 full year, they actually made two million from their operating activities but they had to pay out 1.7 million in capex. So they would have actually been looking quite good in terms of cash flow in 2020. But because they'd bought the pipe shield business in 2019, there was still a 1.6 million they had to pay as a follow on payment for that in 2020. So overall, they ended up 2 million down in 2020. And so that left them a situation where they had a almost comfortable to 4 million in the bank to only 2 million in the bank. And then of course, I wanted to look at the half one 2021 cash flow situation. And this, and in as per the interims, they actually made a loss in the first half of 0.6 million. So the only money they had coming into the business was this 2.7 million COVID loan. To the, on the positive side, their capex costs and other costs seem fairly minimal compared with before. But all the same, they're relying on taking on debt to pay the bills. In terms of the equity and valuation, this is the kind of profile we normally see. This is ITM power. And this is what we normally see for renewable stocks. And it's an absolutely crazy valuation. Um, in terms of the market cap, when you compare it to the net assets and uh, to the revenues. 
But for Tecmar Group, and this is what makes them look quite enticing, is um, their market cap is actually much less than their net assets. In fact, their price to book ratio is only 0.6 and their price to sales 0.7. So they look very enticing with this profile. And when I compare them with the other renewable stocks I've been looking at, they have a much more favorable price to book ratio. Now, if you pretended that they made a million, they're actually making a loss at the moment, but if you pretended they made a million, which is not that far off, that would equate to a price to earnings ratio of 26 to one, which again would look quite good. So there's no doubt about it in terms of the equity, in terms of the equity valuation, it looks very good against their, against their net assets. Now I, wa I was wondering, was this continual drift down perhaps due to some of their larger shareholders? So I took a look at the ownership of this company, uh, who all the big shareholders were. Now, one, one question that came up in the investor call was how many shares does uh, James Ritchie, the ex-CEO, have? So he, of course, was the son of the founder of the company who IPO'd the company, took a million for, as part of that, and then promptly jettisoned away. However, his actual uh, shareholding isn't that much really compared with the overall pie. The other directors have the same as him in combination around 2%. Well, that's the uh, CEO and the CFO together have 2% of the shareholding. I found out in doing this that actually your typical FTSE company is about 15% retail. And for Techmar Group, it's only 9% retail. So the vast majority of all the ownership of this stock is institutional investors. And we see that Schroders here hold a massive 18%. And these other companies have fairly big chunks too. Now I looked across this time period where we see the stock going down. And actually, although there were some companies, particularly BlackRock selling, there were also some others buying. And in particular, Schroders managed to accumulate now an 18% holding. So overall, actually, you can't say it's overall in you can't say it's overall institutional selling, because there's as many buying as there are selling. But of course, if some of them want to offload, then perhaps the other ones that want to buy will get at a cheaper price if they're excessively offloading, and then that could kind of drag the, the share price. However, what I did notice is Schroders, they built it up to 18%. So if you go onto the Tecmar website, you can see all their RNS announcements. And then if you look at the holding in company ones, you can actually track which institutionals are selling and buying. And if we do this, we see that Schroders, they actually had 9.7 million shares in March. And then that went down to, and that then went down to 9.2 million shares, and then down to 9.1 million shares, and that's dated at the end of April. So actually, it is possible, I guess, that it could be Schroders selling, you know, only like a percent or whatever at a time, but um, it could be that uh, Schroders may be responsible for this little dip here. I mean, I don't know for sure, but what I would say is that um, as they do own, what I would say is that as they do own 18% of the overall stock, it certainly would be worth tracking the uh, news reports and seeing if Schroders continue to sell. Because if I see them selling again in the next month or so, that really would be a bit of a kind of warning sign for me. So overall, I'm definitely interested in Techmar Group as a good play on the renewable energy and particularly the wind energy space. Unfortunately, there's been some uh, cryptic messages recently, uh, particularly like not giving future guidance and um, and then the announcement that they're actually their revenues are 10 percent down. And there's this and there's, of course, that cryptic message about there being new competition for the TechLink product. 
and we see that the TechLink product is actually the vast majority of their sales. And there's like a danger of does this um, does this trend continue in the same path for their tech link products? Against that, there's definitely a massive boom going on in the renewable energy, and particularly in the building of wind farms. And so that is what makes me kind of want to invest in them. But we've got to really take account of these problems as well. The biggest kind of worry for me is that it's so wafer thin between them making more money and if the revenues continue to fall and if the revenues continue to fall losing money and so it really is kind of a risky play from that perspective especially then when you consider that they're now uh, taking on debt again just to have some little bit of gas in the tank to keep going and of course their valuation is obviously very enticing so overall, I'm definitely well inclined to put them into my watch list. But I think I want to monitor them over time, look out for the Schroders. I also want to look at them technically, and uh, they're clearly in this downtrend. And I want to wait till I see this downtrend finish before I'd even think of uh, investing in them. But they're definitely in the uh, watch list and it would be good to compare them with other options. And so when I next buy a stock, if they're the best option, then maybe I would buy them. Um, it might be, though, that as well as the technicals, I might really want to wait till September to see their numbers as well first and be prepared to buy them at a higher price just on that knowledge of um, their revenues not you know, of them correcting their problem they have with their revenues. Despite the apparent really good price to book value, it's certainly not an easy decision with this one. So I like to uh, do a summary of my reasons for investing. So that if I do buy, um, I then have my rule set to follow after buying the shares. And if I was buying Tecma, the reason would be because it's got a great price to book ratio. And we expect wind energy to be a massive um, boom in the next 10 years. And they certainly seem the best place so far in terms of their price. But they have to then also be considered a speculative play because they've not got much cash at the moment. And there's this problem with their revenue trend. So before buying them, I'll wait, I'll wait on the technicals to see the uh, price stabilize and then keep an eye out for Schroeder's selling and wait perhaps even to see in their September to see if there we see a change in the velocity of their net income and see it going upwards, not downwards, to then consider them against other opportunities and buy them if I'm just like that little bit more confident in the way they're going. These are kind of very speculative and my sell would be, my plan and exit strategy would be to sell half if they went up three times and then long-term hold until the company matures a bit. Now, Tecma aren't really, in, haven't really been influenced the, in terms of sector. You can see that all the other renewable stuff has been going crazy high and um, Tecma haven't been affected by that at all. So I don't need to worry about that with these. And in terms of financial, they keep an eye on their net income, their sales trend and the cash they have available. The main risks are that their TechLink product revenues continue to fall. And the, and the implication is that this could be due to new competition. And another risk is the Orsted race bank gates thing. And um, I actually obviously did some research into that and consider this a low risk. But if it did happen, it really would have immense damage. So this one completes the Greta Gold series. And I look forward to doing a summary video on that soon. And I hope you've enjoyed this video.